Hello, and welcome to a special edition of DevOps Dialogues. My name is Paul Nashorty. I'm the practice lead for the App Dev Practice at the Futurum Group. I'm joined today by Jack and Mitch. Jack, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Paul. It's great to be here, and thanks for inviting me. I'm Jack Poller. I'm an independent analyst. Uh, I used to be an industry analyst uh, doing research on cybersecurity, focusing particularly on identity and access management and data security. And now I've started my own company called Paradigm Technica, and uh, glad to be here to talk about uh, security with you. Excellent. Thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you. Hey, Mitch. Good to be with you again. <laughs> yeah. This is a habit forming, isn't it? Absolutely. So, Mitch Ashley, and uh, I'm analyst and founder of TechStrong Research and covering uh, cybersecurity as well as DevOps, DevSecOps, AI, and cloud. Uh, a lot of areas I know, but they all tend to intersect these days, right? Thank and you. I also am a practicing CTO, still run our infrastructure and my backgrounds in product creation in those areas. So good to be with you. Yeah, great for great to have you here on and the nice show. Nice to meet Jack. This is my first thank time you. meeting you too. Nice so. meeting you too, Mitch. Great, excellent. And thank you for both. I mean, this is great. I mean, this is a, a very important topic. You know, when I think about uh, my practice and, and the, the conversations that I'm in with a lot of the customers that I've talked to, uh, we often talk about the, the, the past, present, and future, the, the uh, state of applications, where they're going. A lot, the lion's share of applications are running in the heritage kind of state, and they're trying to migrate and bridge the gap over to a more current state, which uses containerization or microservices and such. And when I think about you know, my era of coverage, I think of uh, day zero, day one, day two, so build, release, and operations. And, um, you know, but from a DevOps perspective and platform engineering perspective, um, you can't have the SDLC without some type of security uh, into, integrated into it, right. right? Because you have container security, you have application security. And the funny thing is I was in the conversation recently and I said, oh, well, security is just security. And when you think about it, I'm like, is it physical security? Is it infrastructure security? Is it application security? So I guess maybe, Mitch, maybe we can start there and say, like, when we think of security and we think of you know, the impact to applications, what does that mean to, to you and to DevSecOps? Well, having spent time in the kind of traditional security world as well as doing software, I feel like we're, we're sort of making some of the same mistakes we made in security, which is let's stovepipe every type of security, right? And this is your intrusion prevention. This is your firewall. This is your fill in the dot, right? And as long as we've got one of all those, we're good. And we've, we've done that with shift left and, and things like code scanning, and there's a lot of elements to it. But I've come to think about it as you mentioned SDLC, which is exactly right. Think about end to end, right? How do we design security and how do we operate in a secure way and all the processes, the workflow, steps along the way. But also think about, yes, there's software we're building and we're adding into that you know, from external surfaces, uh, sources. There's also, what about the whole pipeline underneath of the, the tools and technologies that we're doing for our DevOps workflow, CI, CD? That has to be secure as well because software supply chain, not just the ins and outs, but the whole process in between. So I think we have to bring in our security teams because they know this cold, right? They've right. learned those lessons. And so many things you talk about, containerization and, and, uh, and microservices, that looks a lot like nodes on a network communicating over a protocol using secure mechanisms. We've got some great expertise that combined we can do some, some powerful things together. I think. A absolutely. And then when we, when we look at it, uh, talking about from the build perspective, right? You know, you have applications that are being built. You have new executive orders being put in place every day to kind of think about how, you know, these applications are being treated. Um, with acceleration of delivery, what we're seeing in research, we're seeing, Jack, we're seeing that, you know, in a recent study that we did, 24% of respondents indicated that they want to release code on an hourly basis, right. but yet only 8% can do so. And that, that means releasing code on an hourly basis. That's very, very rapid, right? Um, but when you think about that, how, what does that mean from a security and building those applications? Well, fundamentally, the, the challenge is, is security a bolt-on afterthought, or is it really baked into your process and your, your, your product and your process at the beginning of time, right? If you don't think about securing, how do you secure your product? How do you secure access to product? How do you do logins? How do you protect the data? How do you protect the telemetry data, the log data? All of that, if you don't think about that at the beginning of time, 
and design that into the product, then when you go on a rapid CID, CD environment and you're doing releases every hour or every half day or every day, or even if it's every week or every month, it really doesn't matter. It's hard to play catch up with product functionality and security at the same time. And you know what I would really like to see is I would love to see if uh, uh, DevOps organizations could think about um, compensating and, and goaling their developers on both application functionality and security rather than on application functionality and schedules. Yeah, that right. makes I think that's really critical. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. When I was doing, a, I did some trending data over the last right. few years, and and I was showing um, testing as part of the trend, yeah. CI/CD pipeline, and we were seeing that in 2022, the research was showing that only 29 percent of organizations were were doing their testing as continuous testing, but yet in 23, that number jumped up to 66 percent. Right, and it's because you know you don't want to leave your testing to your end users because that's not a good way to do it. Right, no, it isn't. Um, but you know, you touched on something here that I think is interesting. And Mitch, you were talking about it when we look at the the whole SDLC and such. Um, releasing code has to have uh, like almost like a template or a or a blueprint in it, right? And when we think about the impacts of code and security, one way to overcome some of these things is have that S bomb in place. How important S bombs when it comes to that that re that fast release or agile release process for mm -hmm. for DevOps? I think S bombs are a starting point. And right now we're at the generate an S bomb stage, which is really just taking a picture. It's like the Amazon delivery person saying, here's your package on your doorstep. Doesn't mean it's there when you get home, right? Things have changed. I, I think the, the kind of shift we have to make is software is a fluid process. It's a liquid. It's not a solid state because everything around it and in it is changing all the time. Whether it's our own stuff or we're talking to a SaaS service or a database or a security you know, system, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. So part of this fast delivery, I think of it as like quality, right? Mm -hmm. You don't go, let's fix this thing and now our quality is fixed. It's a continuous improvement process. Security is the same way, right? Because you don't always build it all in up front. You've got to add it as you're going and building up your application or your product. And you improve the security over time. You're continually investing in it. So while most of us are not going to release once an hour, that's not just in the DNA of people's ability to to do it, to consume it once an hour, we do need to be able to release code in an hour in an incident yeah, situation, either a bug fix or a security. It's one of those just because we can doesn't mean we have to, but when we need to, we do want to be able to do that. And that's where that repetitive process, having that down and working, when we need to call on it, you know, we've got that uh, nitro boost that we can get right. something into production. Right, and, and, and that also means as you're thinking about how do I enable my organization to do this thing, to move so quickly, is what are all the different things involved in along that process? It's not only the code release, right? It's not only the S-bomb at the time of that snapshot point in time, but it's also what is everything else around it? What's the security picture for the code release and how does that work in my environment? And if I'm releasing once an hour, that may be one sort of environment, but let's say we're releasing once a month or once a week, right? You may release code on Monday, but then on Tuesday, the security environment changes. How does that impact the code, right? So that goes back sort of that continuous testing that it's a fluid dynamic environment. It's not a point in time discrete environment that we now live in. So, so Jack, I mean, I think that's, that's a good point. I, so what are tools like CVEs and um, code scanning, is that enough? No. Okay. It's, it's, well, in, in the cybersecurity world, we believe in what we call defense in depth, right? And some people call it belt and suspenders, right? Um, there are so many different attack paths and so many different attack surfaces that uh, app developers don't necessarily understand because they're not versed in security, they're versed in, in their own application functionality that we need multiple tools and multiple ways of protecting everything we have, mm -hmm. right? And so you need to look at um, scanning your environment to make sure it's up to date and all that's patched for existing CVEs, but you also have to look at other things like your, your identity infrastructure, who has access and why. Are you in a traditional uh, castle and moat uh, environment or are you in a zero trust environment and what does that mean for your application security and your application developers and how do they work around that? 
um, what type of tools do you have for doing forensic investigation, right? When an incident does occur, can you go pinpoint exactly what happened, who had access to your environment, who had access to the data, what else did they touch other than your application, if they broke your application? Mm -hmm. All of those types of things are part and parcel of securing your environment. Now, unfortunately, it's a very complex thing to do, which is also why, you know, I think we touched on it earlier um, in another conversation, but this concept of DevSecOps, DevOps, where does security fit in? Is, you know, is a developer, is a DevOps person a developer primarily? Are they an operations person primarily? Is a security person a DevSecOps person because they're doing security in a DevOps world? Or, you know, it's, there's a lot of different asset, facets to, the, to cybersecurity in this rapid development environment. I like where you were going with that because one of the things I was thinking about is there's a convergence between the security approach and all the different uh, actions you take to uh, to touch the the applications, but there's also the development aspects, right? And um, a trend, not, I won't call it a trend, I guess a, a movement that we're kind of seeing in the, in the application development space is the slimming down process to remove uh, or reduce the attack surface space, right? So, so basically when you, when you modernize an application and put it into a microservice, instead of having the, uh, the common elements replicated across multiple microservices, it's having a microservice with the common elements in it and then only have the business logic on certain containers. So you can reduce that attack space. Um, yes, there's some risks about doing some of this, but for the most part, that does reduce the attack space. Do you think, Mitch, do you think that's a good way to approach uh, software development in the, in the context of all the areas you have to think about with security? Well, just to ingratiate Jack to me, <laughs> it's a segmentation approach, right? right? It's the same ideas in network security or in security in general, Yeah, which is, Let's, let's do small modules, small functionality, I, things that are more atomic or can be isolated, and then we'll scale that up, right? So we can run as many of those as we want if they're containerized or they're, they're a, um, microservices. And I think the, the, the good thing is that network folks can understand not more than just ingress and egress, right, into an application through APIs. They can understand that oh, we're using APIs for all these things to talk to each other, and we don't always know what's going to go external and what's not. Right? How do we control that? So we can do that through gateways, API gateways, and security identity, machine identity. Who's allowed to talk to who? So all those principles still apply. They're just easier to map to a software architecture, and I think that makes that conversation. If I'm in the software, you know, yeah. uh, peanut butter, and you're the you're the security <laughs> chocolate dude. Right, we can talk. And right. we, can, we know how to make that connection. Where before it's like, I don't understand you developers. I don't understand you security people. But it, if, if I may, sure. it, it brings up one thing. You brought up, a, you know, sort of a favorite topic of mine is machine identity, right? Mm -hmm. Machine identity was really easy in the old monolithic application world where you had one application. And, and if you think about even as we got into the cloud world and you had the, the traditional uh, LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP stack, right? You had one application talking to one database, talking to one web front end, right? And it was a very simple environment and there was one machine identity for everything. Now in container service environments, you spin up new, you know, new instances rapidly all the time, right? And you can have go from one to a million almost <coughs> instantly every single one of those needs a separate machine identity yeah. that has to somehow be validated, verified, and checked before you will, from the network perspective, before you even allow the communication to occur, right? Yeah. So it, it, again, it just very quickly goes from that very simple environment to very complex. How do I manage machine identities when I have thousands and thousands of machines rather than 100, and I can manage it on an Excel spreadsheet? Well, yeah. to that point, if I can jump yeah. in, you know, all, all of those identities and all that communication, right. guess what? It's all encrypted, and so there's all certificates behind yes, it, Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, certificates, which we understand from the network world. The challenge is the life of those certificates might be seconds or minutes or, you know, under an hour, uh, constantly being rotated. Software folks don't want to be mess, don't want to mess with that. Yeah. More or less understand how to, want to understand how to manage all of that. That's another place where security can help set up that infrastructure. We know how to manage a PKI. We know how to manage certificates and rotation of keys and things like that. So I think that's another one of those critical ingredients you want to add into the design, into the infrastructure, wherever that starts and stops. It's not always clear. Um, but that, 
that's what creates secure underpinnings of yeah. software you can build apps on. No, it certainly does. And uh, you touched on so much there. Uh, you both did. But Mitch, I think this set the, uh, the, the segue up to a, a conversation around service mesh and north, south, east, east, west traffic, mm -hmm. which we'll probably have at another time because we're running out of time right now. But um, with that, I want to thank both of you for your time and your perspectives on, uh, on this topic. It's really an important topic. Uh, and for the audience, it's just really the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, with that said, to learn more about what we have to offer in our research, come to uh, futurumgroup.com to learn more about it. And with that, have a great day and thank you for your time.